Imagine trying to shoot at a target that is hidden from view. No matter how much self-confidence, experience, and skill you possess, a lack of feedback can leave you wondering, how am I doing? How will I ever hit the target? Trial and error could be one way to do it, but isn't there a more effective way? What if someone who could see the target gave you periodic feedback on how to adjust your approach for the maximum results? Imagine how this could help you align your efforts and focus your energy on the target. In today's dynamic environment, the role of coaching has become a larger part of the manager's job to guide individuals towards the right path to achieve both personal and organizational objectives. These objectives are most effectively met by clearly outlining and defining which activities to focus on. The manager supports this effort by providing the coaching and feedback necessary to motivate and keep people on track. This is an emphasis on people as the lever for improved organizational effectiveness through coaching, feedback, and development. In the next few minutes, we'll take a look at some of the most frequently expressed concerns and challenges facing people who provide coaching and feedback. We'll demonstrate some effective techniques that emphasize a balanced approach to communicating information on the strengths and development needs of employees. Some say it's challenging enough just to provide feedback, let alone to be a coach. A manager must be able to explain to the employee not only what needs to be accomplished, but also provide ongoing guidance and advice to help people make the adjustments. It's at this stage the manager becomes a coach. Coaching is a continuous cycle of observation, reinforcement, and redirection using feedback that helps ensure employees stay on track. This video is divided into three modules. The first focuses on feedback as an essential step in the coaching cycle. The second covers how to coach using feedback, and the third provides an enactment of an employee and supervisor discussing the results of a behavior inventory assessment of managerial competencies. The modules are most effective when all three are viewed, but can be used separately if desired. Feedback in the work environment is information a person gives or receives that is related to work activities. Feedback is the what of someone's actions. When this type of feedback is effectively combined with coaching, employees also receive the how in terms of recommendations for improvement. We can get feedback from a variety of sources. Some are direct, some are indirect, but all can provide valuable information on how we interact with our environment and the people in it. When learning to drive a car or ride a bicycle, feedback is immediate and often obvious. You can change your speed and direction and can make adjustments based on this information. Imagine navigating yourself like a car through your career. Without feedback, how will you know the right direction, what speed is best for you, and what is the best route to get there? In this video, work-related feedback will focus on development to help individuals navigate their careers. Feedback that is behaviorally based can supply individuals with information regarding their effectiveness. The emphasis is to provide balanced feedback that lets people know what they're doing well and what could be improved so adjustments can be made to help them stay on course. Think of it this way. If you don't know how you're doing, how can you improve? Feedback is information that lets people know how they're doing relative to achieving goals. Feedback can be challenging to provide. Many managers don't give feedback because sometimes people may appear unreceptive and can resist making changes. Why would people resist change? Let's ask. Why bother? It won't matter anyway. People may not like me if I do that. I just wouldn't be comfortable. I don't know how to do it differently. What is it about feedback that can make it hard to give and to hear? Think about a time when someone gave you valuable feedback. What made you feel receptive and really hear what was said? What about the situation really worked for you? Was it what was said, how it was said, or who was saying it? All of these factors come into play when providing useful feedback. It is information that provided a clear picture of what you did, what the desired or expected behavior looks like, and the difference between the two. Most importantly, you understood how the desired 
or expected behavior was directly tied to work-related goals or successes. In preparation for the feedback discussion, it is important to have the right amount and type of information to discuss. For example, feedback information can come from a variety of sources, such as self-reports. Talking with employees directly is an excellent way to learn about what they have accomplished and how they did it. Direct observation. Personally observing employees at work will provide valuable information about what they do to achieve their results. Making notes on a regular basis will help make sure specifics are remembered, discussed, and are given the right amount of emphasis. Written materials and reports. Writing samples can help determine someone's current ability level. Input from others. Feedback from others can be a valuable source of information. However, be careful with this information. Be sure to research and verify this type of information when it is used in a feedback discussion. We encourage you to base your feedback whenever possible on your personal observations of the employee's work and use these other forms of information to support the discussion. Additional sources of feedback information can be used in later coaching activities to help find opportunities to develop the employee. How and when feedback is given is just as important as what is said. Karen is a manager with a staff of eight employees. She believes that coaching is an important part of her job and gives them feedback whenever she can. Sometimes it goes well, but other times it doesn't. Let's look at an example. The Adelphi program will enable the team members to conduct SPIs either as a panel or individually based upon their specific requirements. You in the field can use the SSDP to support your registers this fiscal year. What he means to say is the skill-based interview and the supervisory selection and development program rather than SSDP. Richard, really make sure they know what you're talking about. Well, thank you for pointing that out. Sorry about that. When you get used to using acronyms, you can forget that others may not always know what you're referring to. The Adelphi program will enable the team members to conduct skill-based interviews, either individually or in a panel. You in the field can use the, um, to support your own personnel registers this fiscal year. Well, thank you. That's all for this week. We'll meet again next week. Why did you have to embarrass me in front of the group like that? Did you see their faces when you announced that I should not use acronyms? Well, apparently you were not observing their faces when you were rolling off acronyms they'd never heard of. I had to bring it to your attention or you would have totally lost them. Well, I do not feel that I would have totally lost them, but I do feel that you diminished my credibility with your announcement. Karen planned how to approach Richard next time in a manner that would not put him on the defensive. The committee has allocated funds to each of your departments on a priority basis. Each department will receive your initial funds by the first of the month, which can then be used at your own discretion. Why don't we all take a five minute break? What did you do that for? That money is earmarked for training and development and only for organizationally approved courses, not at their discretion. What? That was decided at that meeting you were unable to attend because you were on travel. Well, what do I say then? Well, just tell them the truth. Tell them that you need to clarify a statement you made just before the break because you just received new information. Okay, great. I'll do that. And thanks. Mm -hmm. Notice the difference in how the two situations were handled and how it impacted the way feedback was received? When feedback is provided in a constructive manner, people are more receptive and are more likely to make a change. Notice how Karen not only gave Richard important information, but also worked with him to present the correction to the group in a way that maintained his credibility. Sometimes a person providing feedback may use vague language to ease the blow of bad news and mask the real message. Because feedback is specific to the person, people worry about hurting each other's feelings or people not liking them. Has this ever happened to you? Karen. I thought you did a fine job on that task force. The end product looked okay. Thanks. I really enjoyed working on it. Yeah, however, there is one thing, if you'd like to hear about it, that might help next year. 
Sure, I'm always looking for new ideas. Well, some of the members of the team seemed a bit scattered at times and probably need, well, sort of more leadership. Do you know what I mean? Well, th they seemed a bit scattered. Is well, that what basically, if you just keep doing what you're doing and improve your leadership a little bit, I'm sure that things will be even better next time. Uh, I, I don't know, but I guess. Okay. Good. Keep up the good work. Do you think Karen really knows how she did? What specifically is she supposed to do to improve her leadership? How would you feel? In order for someone to develop or make a change in their behavior, they need to clearly picture it in their minds. If you can't picture it, you can't change it. Let's go back to the conversation with Bob and Karen and see if a different approach would have better results. Karen, I thought the work you did leading the task force was very effective. Thanks, I really enjoyed working on it. The concept your group came up with was really innovative and generated a lot of excitement. Most people present a lot of numbers. Using colorful graphics to represent the annual growth showed the real impact of the project. How did you come up with that idea? Well, we brainstormed most of it. There was some confusion around the decision-making process, but I figured it was just a new way of thinking for them and they'd warm up to it. It all worked out okay in the end. Sometimes people who are used to a fair amount of structure can get stressed when thrown into a group that operates differently. You had a bunch of number crunchers here and asked them to suddenly be creative and free-flowing, but get the end product out as usual. How do you think they felt? I never really gave it much thought. I just did what had worked for me in the past. But I see your point. I guess they might have been a little stressed or confused. You just might want to keep that in mind. Remember who you're working with when you're deciding what approach to take. Thanks. So, do you think Karen has a clear understanding of what worked and what she might do differently next time? People who are used to Bob was direct, but not threatening in his feedback. Group that he asked her about her approach and offered a suggestion for next time that Karen could clearly picture. What to take. During the feedback discussion, yeah. be I candid the and objective. Avoid effective. words that diminish the impact of what you were trying to say, such as the sort of, or really kind of. A lot of Either it was or it wasn't. Present a lot Provide of information, numbers. not judgments. Keep the conversation focused on work behaviors of and outcomes. That way, that you will remain yeah, focused on the action, the not the person. The Keep the conversation two-way. Ask the employee for his or her opinion and discuss points of interest or concern. Build the employee's self-esteem by praising what was done well. Balance this with a discussion of areas that need development. Don't rehash every detail, but look for things that may seem to hinder the employee's success. The timing is everything. Be very selective about when and where you give someone feedback. Be sure that feedback is given soon after the event, but certainly not in situations that could lead to embarrassment. Be sensitive to others' feelings and perceptions. It is hard to remember specifics if too much time passes. Some people tend to avoid talking about problems until they are a crisis. When the discussion finally occurs, it is often too late for effective problem solving and can make some feel defensive and helpless. Make feedback as timely as possible and in the right setting. Have you ever seen something like this happen? Richard, what is going on with this presentation? Meaning? What exactly are you trying to say? I can't make heads or tails of this graph, and I'm certainly not going to stand up in front of that group tomorrow and look like an idiot. Well, perhaps if we could go to your office and talk about your specific concerns, I could explain. I don't have time for that. You know how I like my presentations. Just do them like I ask. Needless to say, timing of feedback is critical, but so is the setting. Be aware of who might see or overhear the feedback discussion. Be aware that public criticism only leads to embarrassment. If this occurs, people are not likely to hear anything you have to say. Find a suitable location for the discussion and watch your tone. Let's revisit the scene and see Karen try a different approach. 
Richard, could we sit down for a couple of minutes and go through this presentation? Sure. Where do you want to meet? How about my office in 15 minutes? Sure. I'll be right there. Let me just get something off the printer. Hey, I have some questions about the graphs in the last two pages. I don't understand what they're saying. Oh, <laughs> I see. I forgot to put in the key so you'd know what the different bars mean. Yeah, that would help. <laughs> could you have this revised by 3 o'clock so I could review it before the presentation? Sure. Sorry. Even when using all of the strategies mentioned here, feedback can still be challenging. Let's ask some supervisors and managers what some of their biggest challenges are. Excuse me, sir, in your position at work, do you have to manage people? Yes, I have a staff of 10. Do you ever provide them feedback? Of course, it's part of my job. What's the biggest challenge you face when providing feedback? The silent treatment. When they won't say anything. When they just sit there and look at you like this. What do you do in your feedback discussion when your employee gives you the silent treatment? Let's take a look at how to deal with this. So, can you see why Kathy reacted that way during the group meeting when you cut her off so quickly? I guess. Based on the way you responded to her question in the meeting, Kathy probably thought you didn't care what she said. Do you agree that allowing others to voice their opinion is a more effective approach? I guess. What do you think you could try next time? What you suggested. <sighs> okay, then. Let me know if you have any further thoughts on the idea. What do you see happening here? What could Karen do differently to develop a two-way conversation? To promote a two-way discussion, ask questions that cannot be answered with one word, such as yes or no. Let's give Karen the opportunity to rephrase that question. Jennifer, I would be interested in knowing what you thought about the way Kathy reacted at the group meeting. I mean, she was shooting her mouth off at every opportunity she got. She wouldn't let anybody else get a word in edgewise. What could you do to deal with someone like that? I don't know. Well, maybe you've seen others deal with it in the past. How do you normally handle it? I guess normally I would just kind of just let everybody else You talk. can see how this technique see creates a two-way conversation. Another challenge is the ability to manage silence. Giving a person time to think about how to answer a question is also important. Try not to fill those moments of silence with more conversation. Let the person take the time needed to discuss the issues. Uh, what are some of the other challenges you face with feedback? People getting defensive. Then the situation becomes very uncomfortable. People are reacting. Things tend to get tense after that. No one hears anything. People getting their feelings hurt and taking things way too personally. But come to think of it, it is personal. Let's see why people would respond this way. Let's go back to Karen and Richard. Richard, I would like a moment to discuss your program. Sure. What specifically are you interested in? Well, for starters, I'm concerned you're way over budget as well as a few other issues. Well, I will admit we're a little tight at this point coming down to the final stretch. But a lot of that had to do with some problems we had in getting the team together to complete the final report. Why was that a problem? They just had a hard time coordinating, that's all. Well, why was that? Well, some of the team members don't work exactly the same, so it's difficult to get everybody in sync. For example, I take a little longer to proof a document, so turnaround takes a little longer. Well, why are you so slow? Well, I like to take my time and be very methodical about it. Others tend to rush, but I just work better at a slower pace. Well, what could you do to change your approach to work better with the group? Well, I don't know about my approach. I mean, it has always worked for me in the past. Maybe it's the group, you know? Richard, as project manager, it's your responsibility to see that the job is done in an efficient and effective manner, whatever it takes. You're ultimately responsible. The end result reflects on you just like you reflect on me. So I assume you'll take care of it. Fair enough? I guess so. Why would Richard feel defensive in this situation? Do you feel he's motivated to change? Most importantly, how will he interact with Karen in the future? Probably not very positively. Be careful when asking why questions. It's hard to ask a why question without sounding critical or blaming. 
One technique to use is paraphrasing. Paraphrasing lets you respond to the other person and put what they say into your own words without changing the meaning. Let's go back and watch Karen try some paraphrasing techniques. Richard, I'd like to take a moment to discuss the program you're managing. Sure. What uh, specifically are you interested in? Well, for starters, I'm concerned that the budget's getting tight, as well as a few other issues. Well, I will admit that we're a little tight at this point, coming down to the final stretch. But a lot of that had to do with some problems we had in getting the team together to complete the final report. What type of problems? Well, they just had a hard time coordinating, that's all. Well, what about it is challenging? Well, some of the team members don't work exactly the same, so it's a little hard to get everyone in sync. For example, I take longer to proof a document, so turnaround takes a little longer. Uh, so everybody is doing their own thing and at a different pace. That makes it difficult to get together in a timely fashion. Yeah. I like to take my time and be very methodical about it. Others tend to rush, but I just work better at a slower pace. Well, what could you do so the deadlines are met? Maybe let everyone work the way that suits them best, as long as we agree on how the objectives are met. So you feel it's okay for everyone to work at their own pace, so long as the ultimate goal is met? Well, yes, unless their particular approach interferes with somebody else's, but I don't see where that would happen on this job. You can see that Karen understood how Richard saw the situation and was able to discuss it with him. Let's see another. So how's it going so far with the project team? It's been a good learning experience. I find myself getting a little stressed at times, though. Is there anything specific that's causing that stress? Yeah, I get frustrated because I don't have direct control over some of the people on the project team. And it's a high-risk project that I'm personally going to be evaluated on, so I'm just a little worried. So you're concerned that you might be evaluated on the quality of work produced by people that you don't manage. Yeah, it's not like I really have any position power or authority to ask them to do things. So I guess I need to come up with some different ways to motivate them, but I don't know what will work. Hmm. So you are now challenged to find new ways to incentivize people to do a good job. Yeah, so I guess I have to devise some strategies on how to do that. Do you have any good ideas? As a matter of fact, I do have some good ideas. You can see how Ellen's approach made Kirsten feel like she understood her situation and was supportive. This approach can communicate that you understand their perspective and helps the employee feel like you care about how they're doing. Now that you've seen some good feedback techniques, think about where coaching comes into play. This is a good opportunity to coach an employee. You'll notice from the last conversation that often feedback and coaching go hand in hand. This is not always the case, but more often than not, if done correctly, the two can complement each other as a development opportunity. Coaching and feedback should not be a one-time process or annual event. Rather, it is a continuous cycle of feedback, mutual planning, and coaching. The workplace provides lots of opportunities for coaching. To coach effectively, it is important to know which situations are appropriate for coaching. You can provide instruction, guidance, and encouragement by knowing when, where, and what to coach. Knowing when to coach is just as critical as mastering the coaching skill itself. Part of being an effective manager or supervisor is identifying situations that need coaching. Although many supervisors advertise an open door policy, employees are often hesitant to walk through the door and openly say what is on their minds. Consequently, a supervisor must recognize the signs that indicate coaching is needed. Although many situations can signal coaching opportunities, we have identified some you can look for. Coaching opportunities exist when orienting and training employees, explaining how the organization works. Identify a task that can be performed more effectively or efficiently and decide who would benefit from doing it. Provide the necessary instruction, guidance, or resources to complete a task. Listening to an employee's request for help in handling a situation. When an employee has demonstrated improvement through training and development activities. 
discussions around changes in the organization's goals, conditions, work standards, or in reporting relationships provide an opportunity for discussion. These opportunities may not be obvious unless you are tuned into looking for them. For example, when a unique project arises, do you give it to the person who will do it best or the person who will learn most? The more effective coach would consider the second possibility as an opportunity to learn and provide guidance along the way. Coaching and feedback can be combined for employee development. However, each can be provided separately. Feedback, remember, is the what of performance. In some situations, you can provide feedback to an individual who can make adjustments without coaching. In some instances, perhaps from personal experience, you will know that particular employees can develop with information alone. Coaching, however, is most effective when personalized with individual feedback examples so employees can more clearly picture their approach and how a change in tactic can make a positive difference. Feedback is clearly a valuable part of the coaching process. When conducting a feedback discussion, begin the conversation with relevant work or neutral topics. After discussing the purpose of the meeting, be sure to ask for the individual's thoughts or opinions so he or she becomes involved in the discussion. Thanks for coming in. How's it going? Oh, not too bad. We were up late last night trying to meet the deadline on the Alpha project. You know, every time you prove something, you find one more thing that's not quite right, and then you've got to go back over everything one more time. Oh, I can sure relate to that. That project has been a never-ending nightmare from the beginning. I'm sure we'll all be glad to be done with it. Yeah. I realize we're all crashing on one thing or another these days, and we all have a pretty hectic schedule. But I wanted to take the opportunity to get your perceptions on the presentation you did yesterday morning to the council. That's a pretty interesting crowd. You're telling me. Interesting is putting it lightly. Remember, by asking for individuals' perspectives, you are better able to understand how they interpreted the situation. Let's watch Karen's approach. How would you describe them? I would say difficult, fairly unpleasant. I've had better receptions. When you say difficult, what do you mean? Well, they didn't say much. They just kept looking at their handouts. And when they did ask a question, it was usually in a hostile and condescending tone. By asking for their approach, you can learn specifics about what actions they took or are thinking about for the future. Well, can you give me an example of that? Yeah, when Mr. Morton asked me about projected expenditures for the next year and how that would impact transportation availability. And how did you answer? I told him I had reviewed the expenditures and the figures were on his handout on page 15. He then said to me in a really snide voice, that's not what I asked you. I asked about implications regarding transportation availability. And then he just stared at me with this scowl on his face. What did you say then? I told him that budget would not be impacted when compared with all other areas. <laughs> I mean, I thought that would appease him. I guess it did. Uh, he didn't ask any more questions. Although, come to think of it, he and his assistant director did leave the presentation early. When you see an opportunity for coaching, Try to learn more about why the employee selected a particular approach or has a certain perspective. Karen has recognized that Richard may not have read his audience well enough to understand their reaction to him. Why do you think they acted that way? You got me. I saw the numbers, and to me, the numbers speak for themselves. What more do you want? I mean, I take great pride in always having my figures straight and my documentation in order. Yes, that's true, you do. But what I'm interested in is beyond the facts and figures, how do you go about preparing for a presentation? What do you mean? For instance, what did you know about the people at the meeting and why they were there? Well, I had an attendee list. Uh, I guess about as much as everybody else knows. Why? What are you getting at? Often the success of a presentation is knowing your audience and anticipating their reaction. Based on this, you tailor your presentation as sort of a selling tactic. This is a different kind of preparation. Richard, you are one of the brightest project managers we have in this department. You are very conscientious and detail-oriented. Your work for me is always flawless. What I would like to focus on is how you present information to a particular audience. Well, that sounds good. What do you have in mind? Well, for instance, 
with the right research, you would have known that Morton's budget was all but eliminated in Mundy's downsizing, and he's mad. So knowing this, instead of referring Morton back to the document in his hand, you could have cited alternative funding measures that your project would provide. Do you see what I'm saying here? Yeah, so get him to see something in it for him based on his current situation. <laughs> I guess I could have come across a little more sensitive. Hmm. Well, let's find a way to work on this. Think about the approach Karen took in this discussion. Karen was a good listener. Listening means more than hearing. It requires attention and involves understanding what was said. Effective listening is a key piece of the coaching and feedback process to think about what is being said rather than jumping to conclusions or making assumptions. Clear communication is a key factor to a successful discussion. Once the information is clear, coaching can be done around specific areas. Karen focused on Richard's presentation of information and learning to read his audience. She gave specific examples and some ideas on how he could improve. Also, keep in mind that coaching will not be seen as helpful and genuine when the coach does all the talking. Employees should be given the opportunity to present their opinions, suggestions, and solutions. In doing so, they are more likely to feel it is fair and objective. The greatest impact is that employees will feel they can influence the outcome. In coaching, it is important to recognize effective approaches that work. While the results are important and usually obvious, an effective coach also focuses on how the individual got the results. Make sure that you are focusing on the approach that was taken and not just the results. Start by preparing for the coaching discussion by putting some thought into what you will say and do. Here are some basic guidelines. When preparing for a coaching discussion, ensure there are no distractions and allow enough time for a thorough conversation. Review the individual's progress to date on the topic and jot down any key points you want to cover. The setting where the meeting takes place, the tone of the conversation can all help facilitate a two-way discussion. Conduct the discussion as we demonstrated earlier with Karen and Richard. Regular coaching sessions should occur with balanced feedback on employee progress. This reinforces and renews their commitment to goals. To increase the likelihood that the commitment to improvement is made during this discussion, generate a series of next steps that are specific actions for the individual to take that can be followed up. Through the coaching and feedback cycle, the managers and employees are able to make adjustments as necessary in either the goals or the approach to be taken. Karen, I thought the work you did leading the task force was very effective. Thanks, I really enjoyed working with you. Increase motivation by reinforcing good performance and giving constructive feedback. Yeah, so I guess I have to devise some strategies on how to do that. Do you have any good ideas? As a matter of fact, I do have some good ideas to help you through this stressful time period. Great. Help the employee learn and develop on an ongoing basis. Another important aspect of coaching is style. There are a number of coaching styles, some more effective than others. A coach's style and attitude will influence the coaching process and interaction with the individual. It is important for a coach to be aware of his or her style to determine whether they are helping or hindering the learner. A coach using a directive style tends to identify a problem and solve it for an individual. Rather than helping the individual in a situation, the directive coach would rather take control and tell the person how to handle it. So when you give your briefing, how are you going to explain the concept behind the new Gamma organization? I thought I would start out with an overview of the force that actually drives change. Okay, so what's that force? It's the response to increased global competition for scarce resources. Well, no, it's not really a response. It's an anticipation. You see, we want the Gamma organization to function as a pioneer and not be perceived as being reactive. So it's not really a response. Oh, okay. So then I'll go on to talk about how the organization is positioning itself to be responsive to customer needs based on new telecommunications requirements no. that are in the... Remember now, not 
respond? Aren't we supposed to be customer service oriented and therefore be responsive to their needs? Yes, but what we're focusing on is anticipating their needs and offering services that they perhaps didn't think of. We are going to lead, not respond. And not that we aren't being customer service oriented. All right. So then I will ask them, what are the biggest challenges facing them today? OK, so what's the objective there? Um, to link what we do with what they do. And? And point out the many benefits of moving towards an organization like the Gamma, emphasizing the services we provide. You, you just don't get this, do you? We are so far ahead of everyone with our efforts. I mean, this is our opportunity to hit them right between the eyes and say, hey, we're out here. Jump on the bandwagon and be on the cutting edge with us. But why don't we let you do the piece on data analysis? That way you can respond to questions regarding statistics. Would that be more helpful for you? Well, whatever you think works best. Directive coaches tend to provide unconstructive and critical feedback and possess certain attitudes about employees. Their attitudes about employees include the following. When you give people a chance, they usually mess up. If you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. People shouldn't rock the boat. Just do their jobs. On the other hand, a coach with a non-directive style tends to not control the situation. Instead, this coach will help the individual identify and solve a problem. Coaches with less directive styles tend to provide constructive feedback. Their attitudes about employees include the following. People work best when they see how their work helps to achieve goals. You get good results when employees are actively and intelligently involved in their work. Disagreements and problems often generate creative ideas and solutions. I don't have all the answers. There are a few simple rules that can produce effective coaching outcomes. Relate coaching to actions and approaches. Very general statements can make someone defensive. Identify specific instances and explain the impact on the organization. Provide the employee a direct cause-effect link between actions and approaches and consequences. For example, Richard, the content of your reports is always top-notch. However, when you don't catch something simple like a typo, it can really detract from the quality of the report in other people's eyes. That reflects on the entire division as lacking attention to detail. Well, I always thought, hey, everybody makes mistakes. They know I'm human. Sorry, I'll focus my attention on better proofing. Great. Let's maintain our reputation as one of the best. Provide coaching in a timely fashion. Coaching is beneficial if it occurs prior to an event in the form of advice or immediately after the event as constructive feedback. If the instruction or advice cannot be directly linked to a specific situation or action, the employee may be confused or become frustrated with the guidance. So what do you think the general thought of the briefing? I thought he liked it. I mean, you did a great job at reading him. When he started thumbing ahead, you just picked up the pace and kept his attention. Yeah, I saw halfway through that I was starting to lose him as well as Larry. So mm -hmm. I jumped ahead in the briefing to the project timeline. Was that okay? Absolutely. You didn't leave out anything critical and it just kept the meeting flowing. That was a good take. Thanks. You're welcome. All these points are important in your coaching efforts, but most of all, be genuine. The purpose of coaching is to provide guidance or instruction to benefit the individual. If it is not intended for this purpose, it is probably better left unsaid. Coaching is only successful if it is truly provided for development and if a supportive atmosphere is created where employees are not afraid to make an occasional mistake and learn from it. My supervisor gives me the impression she thinks I'm stupid. She can always find something wrong in everything I do but she won't help me improve. Although she calls it feedback, so she thinks her job is done. See, that's too bad. Whenever my manager and I have discussions, I feel she's trying to be supportive. She always listens to what I have to say, and we usually go with the ideas I've come up with. 
She says she trusts my judgment. Mm -mm. Maybe the two should meet. Yeah, <laughs> we'll fix it. Provide that. guidance on actions the individual can control. A situation that pertains to an action or approach that the individual is directly involved with. Last week while I was out, Vic went straight to the director complaining about budget allocations. The director then chewed me out because one of my employees came directly to him instead of going through me. Well, I guess that wasn't the best judgment. What concerns me is why you didn't counsel him in my absence. You're a level higher in the organization than he is. I thought you would be responsible for mentoring him in these types of situations. Well, he's not in my group, and I don't recall that being part of my job description. Besides, I was on travel last week as well and hadn't heard about this until this very moment. Why am I suddenly responsible for his actions? You should assume responsibility for all colleagues below you. And you should coach them properly so that they know to come to you when I'm not around. In a coaching discussion, an employee may be uncomfortable at first and be highly sensitive to every word communicated. Sentences should not begin with, you did, or insinuate that everyone in the workplace holds some strong feelings about the individual. Such generalization will cause the employee to become defensive and lose self-esteem. Let's see another version of that. Last week while I was out, Vic went straight to the director complaining about budget allocations. The director then chewed me out because one of my employees came directly to him instead of through me. Well, I guess that wasn't the best judgment. I have a thought on how this situation can be avoided in the future. Perhaps you could step in my role when I'm not available, potentially when I'm on travel or just very busy. You're a level higher in the organization than he is. I thought you could be responsible for mentoring him in these types of situations. Well, he is not in my group. Would that become a formal responsibility? For example, I was on travel last week as well and hadn't heard about this until this very moment. You could assume some responsibility for all colleagues below you, and we could develop some memos that discuss a role change, and we could also start coaching people so that they think to come to you when I'm not around. Remember also that reinforcement can be a type of feedback that supports coaching. Look to reinforce and identify the results that meet or exceed standards. There are many types of reinforcement that coaches can use. Examples of reinforcers include a verbal pat on the back, control or management of a significant task or project, greater visibility with management, an award or acknowledgement. Give some thought to the types of rewards you can use to acknowledge a job well done and improvements people have strived to reach. It is these behaviors that are then more likely to be repeated in the future. As an enhancement to its existing career management program system, the Air Force has begun assessing managerial competencies of employees. Managerial competencies are behaviorally defined characteristics of top performers. Top performers demonstrate these characteristics or managerial competencies more often in more situations and with better results than average or typical performers. In this module, we will see how Karen will use the results from the behavior inventory assessment to give Richard feedback. Are you ready to meet? I sure am. Come on in. We might want to refer to information on the computer later, so I'll stay at my desk. No problem. Richard, as you know, I wanted to meet with you today to discuss the results from the managerial competency assessment. Let me just say before we begin, this is not a part of your performance appraisal and is not a performance rating. The purpose of this meeting is for us to discuss the results from the managerial competency assessment we completed and, if need be, identify specific resources or developmental activities that you could pursue. Okay? Okay. Let's have a look at your results from the behavior inventory. There are two areas that stand out as strengths, developing others and high standards of excellence and efficiency. What does that mean? 
Well, the career program provides definitions of the managerial competencies on the web. Let's take a look at the definitions of these two managerial competencies. Let's look at developing others first. Frequently and spontaneously takes time to coach others, provides honest feedback and assistance with tasks. You talked to Brian about his performance in career development on several occasions. Yes, that's something I really value. I think it's important to spend time with those who report to me in terms of helping them improve their skills and abilities. Well, that time seems to be paying off. Karen and Richard continued their discussion of Richard's strengths. They focused their discussion around observed behaviors that Richard demonstrated on the job. Let's rejoin the conversation a bit later on in the discussion. My score for judgment and analytical thinking is lower than the others. Is that bad? Not at all. No score is a bad score. Everyone has individual strengths, and everyone has areas they could improve. So what does this result indicate? Well, let's take a look at the definition of judgment and analytical thinking on the website. Hmm. Identify and use if A, then B approaches for identifying potential obstacles or making decisions that will impact the future. Hmm. Well, I feel like I do that all the time. I mean, that's part of my job, to solve problems. Well, that is an important part of your job. But sometimes I sense that you develop a solution to a problem that could work, but doesn't get to the root of the problem. If the root cause isn't addressed, the problem reoccurs. I think you could benefit from stepping back, perhaps even diagramming out the situation to, to determine the true underlying cause and resolve the situation once and for all. Remember that situation with that contract out of Iowa? Yeah, they had problems getting the contract written to the specifications, so I helped them cut through some of the red tape. Right. And six months down the road, what popped back up? <laughs> That same group kept calling me again and again to help them handle the contractor's concerns about getting paid. Those shortcuts were great short-term tactics, but the problem was a longer-term issue with the wording of the original contract. That needed to be rewritten for contract compliance. I think you could catch that if you take time to analyze the root cause of the situation. Think about cause and effect relationships. Well. Based on my results and also on what we've discussed, that might be a good area to develop. Well, good cause and effect thinking is an important aspect of the position. It can really help with problem solving. Richard, I think you're good at relating to the big picture, but it's also important to think about the implications of things, perhaps a chain of events of how things will play out in terms of root causes and effects. So uh, what can I do to improve? Well. The information in the Training and Development Guide on the Career Program website uh, should give us some good ideas. Let's take a look. There's a section that lists all the formal training courses we could consider nominating you for that would help you develop the competency. That sounds good. Here's a course that I think that would be good for development. It's given by the Office of Personnel Management. From the course description, it sounds like that might be a good one to attend. The career program has also provided us with training information on developmental activities you can work on through your normal job act duties. Here's an idea. Participate in a special project. That will require you to use several competencies, including judgment and analytical thinking. Hmm. I actually have something in mind I think would provide a good opportunity for you. Sounds good. Let's schedule some time to talk about it in more detail. There's one more thing about your managerial competency assessment I wanted to discuss with you. On your assessment, I noticed your score for tenacity was relatively high, while your score for working through others' group leadership was lower. The high score in tenacity may need to be tempered by improving your ability to work through others. Hmm. I see what you mean. There have been a couple of situations when I've been so focused on achieving an objective that I didn't always involve everyone on the team. Let's talk a little bit more about a specific situation where that happened, and then we can discuss ways you may want to handle it differently in the future. Sounds like Karen and Richard are off to a good discussion on Richard's managerial competency data. You too can use this instrument to guide mutual conversations for development and identify specific coaching opportunities. 
It provides an easy means to target key areas for feedback, coaching, and generating ideas for development. In these modules, you have seen some of the challenges most often associated with providing feedback and coaching, as well as some strategies for handling them. Try these techniques out in your everyday work activities. When you begin to make feedback and coaching part of your daily activities, you establish a standard of ongoing communication that others will follow that can eventually become a common occurrence. Perhaps then it might not be so challenging. After all, if someone who could see the target gave you feedback and coaching, imagine how this could help you align your efforts and focus your energy on the target.